Okay, welcome back everybody. So for, for Christian Lauter's second lecture. So yeah, please go ahead. Okay, thanks everyone. So um, at the end of the last uh, talk, I, I saw that there was a question in the chat um, that uh, was sent to me afterwards about kind of what was, what was the outline? What was the next uh, steps in the lecture series? And so I thought it would be good to just uh, kind of uh, do a little outline here so everybody knows what, what we're doing, where we're going, and just a little reminder of what we talked about in the first, uh, in the first lecture. Um, so in the first lecture, I kind of introduced the basic ideas of cryptography as a field, what, what are the um, kind of goals and major primitives talked about um, the current threat of quantum computers to existing public key crypto, crypto systems based on very well-known math problems and the, the notion of what, what do we mean by a hard math problem in cryptography and the you know, kind of post-quantum crypto systems that are currently being considered. Um, I also uh, explained the importance um, of hash functions and gave a construction of a cryptographic hash function uh, from expander graphs and, and then gave a particular example of an expander graph, which we originally proposed, which was called a super singular isogeny graph. So just as a little reminder, um, I think that um, I... Uh, had a slide here which said what the super singular isogeny graphs are. So S the SIG super singular isogeny graphs, the vertices are isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curves mod P that each have a representative defined either over FP or FP squared. They're labeled by J invariants. The edges are um, isogenies uh, between these elliptic curves. The isogenies are these um, birational maps from the geometric point of view, but from the algebraic point of view, you can think of them as quotienting the group, the, the group of points of the elliptic curve by some subgroup. And the formulas for computing isogenies for elliptic curves were given in the 1970s by Velu. So that's just kind of a quick recap. And this was the picture that I showed of the super singular isogeny graphs from, um, Science Magazine from 2008. So um, now let me tell you what we're gonna do in the second and third lectures. Uh, so I realized there's quite a few properties which I uh, kind of glossed over very quickly in the end of my last lecture because I was kind of running out of time. And I got a little feedback from Bjorn that it would be good to write some of the um, mathematical um, notation and uh, symbols and things down a little bit more uh, clearly for at least for the things that I feel like are really important um, to know. And so I'm going to start by explaining a little bit more about expander graphs and the Ramanujan property. There was a question about the Ramanujan property in the chat as well. Um, and then I'd like to talk about another application of super singular isogeny graphs, which is very important, which is key exchange, psych, super singular isogeny key exchange, which is one of the candidates in the key exchange um, competition that NIST is uh, currently running. Um, and so if I have time, I'll also get to kind of the generic attacks on these systems, because the third lecture, I like to spend tomorrow mostly talking about quaternion algebras, and an algorithm for um, solving this kind of problem, this pathfinding problem on the quaternion side and a constructive application of that algorithm which, um, to constructing uh, digital signatures. Okay, so let me talk, start by talking about expander graphs. So I mentioned this in my last uh, talk. Um, the notation that we use for a graph is this V comma E, the set of vertices and edges. And we say that it's K regular if each, uh, again, I'm, I'm only talking about undirected graphs here. Uh, each vertex has K edges uh, coming out of it. Um, an expander graph is um, a graph that has a um, positive expansion constant C it's also sometimes called the Cheeger constant. And I just said this in words last time, but 
um, I've written it down for you here, is if you take any subset of the vertices up to half the size of the graph, and then you look at the boundary of those vertices, which are all the neighbors of, the, of that set, but which are not in the original set. If the size of the neighboring set is at least um, C times the size of the original set, um, then we say that it's an expander graph. So if, if C is bigger than one, then this is kind of expanding as you can see. And um, this expansion constant is important because um, now, so now I'd like to talk about the adjacency matrix for a graph. So adjacency matrix is um, just the ij entry is the number of edges from uh, the i vertex to the j vertex. And um, so in the L isogeny graph, we'll call this matrix A of L. Uh, assuming P is, is fixed. I didn't put the P down here. But um, so if, as you can see, if the graph is undirected, then this matrix is symmetric because you have the same number of edges going from I to J as you go, as you have going from J to I. And so for a symmetric adjacency matrix, all its eigenvalues are real. And uh, for a connected K regular graph, it's a fact that the largest eigenvalue is K and all of the others are strictly smaller. So I'm gonna use this notation mu one, mu two, et cetera, for the eigenvalues in a kind of decreasing size. So if K is the largest one, the second largest one we're calling mu one. Sorry about that. Maybe you think we should call it mu two, but we're calling it mu one. And this distance between K and mu one, so K minus mu one, is often called the spectral gap. So this series of eigenvalues is called the kind of the spectra and the distance between, the difference between the first two is the spectral gap. The spectral gap is um, important um, in, in when uh, considering expander graphs because the expansion constant can be expressed in terms of the eigenvalues and the spectral gap. So this is, I wrote down this one uh, bound here, um, but I also was looking, there's, I used to have more uh, detailed slides on, on this topic. Um, there's, for example, like the Elan Milman, Milman theorem that um, gives you other kind of variants of these bounds. But the basic idea is that the, um, the bigger the spectral gap, the bigger the expansion constant. So that means the more the graph is expanding. And um, that means the, the smaller the eigenvalue mu one is, the better the expansion is. So now let's tie this to the Ramanujan property. What does this have to do? What is, what is a Ramanujan graph? And what does this have to do uh, with the expansion constant? Well, there's this uh, general theorem proved by Alain Bopana, which um, looks at families of graphs asymptotically. So if you have an infinite family of connected K regular graphs with the number of vertices uh, tending to infinity, then they prove that the limb nth of this mu one is going to be greater than or equal to the square root two times the square root of k minus one. So that motivates. So it's saying that um, the tendency is going to be that um, the the limb limb nth is going to be greater than or equal to. Um, this two square root k minus one. So you can think of it like, you know, could be tending towards k, for example, like the spectral gap is going to zero. But a Ramanujan graph is saying like, oh, let's have a graph where mu one is actually bounded by this two square root of k minus one. So that it's kind of like bounded away from k and it's making this spectral gap basically as big as it can be like in the limit. Now, one thing that's always kind of bothered me about this definition, and I've seen a little bit of variation in the literature in terms of how people talk about this, but is, is that the first uh, theorem on my slides here is an asymptotic result. And it's saying, it's saying something about what happens in the limit of a family of graphs um, to the eigenvalues. Whereas uh, when we talk about a Ramanujan graph um, or a construction of a particular Ramanujan graph, 
um, we're talking about its second eigenvalue and its spectral gap. And so there's nothing that says that, you know, um, the spectral gap, you know, can't be, can't be bigger just for a particular example. Um, but we say that if that mu one is less than or equal to two times the square root of k minus one, um, then we say that this is a Ramanujan graph. And so what you'll see is in the literature and this crosses over to the computer science field um, for people that talk about, that work on uh, expander graphs and um, theorems and expander graphs, they actually have a very different terminology. Um, and it's actually the, the notation is a big barrier. That's one of the reasons that I actually often try to give talks where I explain things without using any notation, because I find that people in different fields that talk about the same thing using different notation make it really hard for each other to understand each other across fields. And that's within mathematics. So imagine how bad it is within between mathematics and computer science, which is where I'm almost always working at the interface of math and computer science. So um, the, a lot of the papers in the, on uh, the, the expansion properties of these kind of expander graphs are written in the terminology of computer science, which can make them a little bit hard to read. But the idea that hopefully I've gotten across here is that if you have a Ramanujan graph where you have basically optimal, uh, uh, optimally large spectral gap, that means that translates into having very good um, expansion properties. And the expansion constant is related to the um, uh, extent to which you approximate the uniform distribution with a short walk. So um, I'm going to say something about the Ramanujan property, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about these short walks approximating the uniform distribution. Um, so there was a question about um, the uh, the Pizer graphs or the um, the supersingular isogeny graphs. You know why are they Ramanujan? And um, uh, Bjorn put a comment in the Discord uh, server for me about um, the general case. So you see the the um, the link on the bottom of my slide here for the higher dimensional analog, which includes the dimension one elliptic curve case. Um, but I was thinking, oh, um, what about just the dimension one case? And they're a nicer, easier way to explain the Ramanujan property. And so um, indeed, um, uh, Bjorn might have also mentioned uh, this paper by Mestre La Methode de Graph, which I actually found an in English translation by uh, William Stein, uh, I put the link here. And La Méthode de Graph paper is uh, by Mestra um, shows that the action of the HECA operator TL on a certain space of uh, vector space of modular forms, which is S2 of P, the uh, vector space of weight to uh, cusp forms of level P, that the action of the HECA operator is actually given by the Brandt matrix, which is equal to this adjacency matrix that I defined on the previous slide. So what you have is now a relationship between, what we're saying is, is that the eigenvalues of the HECA operator are just equal to the eigenvalues of this adjacency matrix for um, the, way, the way I defined the adjacency matrix for uh, the supersingular isogeny graph, which is a very beautiful and deep connection if you think about it. On the one hand, I define the supersingular isogeny graph to be a collection of supersingular elliptic curves um, with uh, L, you know, L isogenies between them. On the other hand, you have this space of modular forms with the HECA operator. And we're saying that um, this is a very kind of beautiful and deep theorem that these are um, that the action of the heck operator is given by the Brandt matrix, which is the adjacency matrix. So um, the fact again that the eigenvalues of this matrix satisfy the Ramanujan condition again is another deep theorem. So the um, the proof that we gave in our paper for the higher dimensional case it, um, depends on the Jack A. Langlands. Uh, correspondence, which relates um, our graphs to um, spaces of Hilbert modular forms, 
And um, the Ramanujan property follows from a theorem of Leibniz. Um, so in the, in the um, dimension one case, um, the uh, Ramanujan property follows from the, the theorems of Deligne and the proof of the vague conjectures. So I'm not gonna get into any more detail on that now. So now um, it's very important to be able to think about uh, these uh, graphs, these super singular isogeny graphs in terms of the walks around, around the graph. So going back to the example I gave where L equals two. So yesterday we, or uh, Monday we talked about if um, L equals two, then you're just quotienting your, your uh, you have two isogenies for the edges and you're quotienting each elliptic curve by a two torsion point, a subgroup of order two. And so the, for large P, you know, the two torsion on elliptic curve, just as an abelian group, it just looks like Z mod two cross Z mod two. So you actually have exactly three uh, different um, two torsion subgroups and they, uh, you can um, take a walk, um, but if you want to take a non-backtracking walk, after you've taken a step, you cannot go backwards along that um, edge that you came along. So you only have two choices for your next edge. So what that means, if you have some starting point in the graph and you take a walk of length n, and let's say you never, like accidentally find a collision because these are optimal expander graphs. And if you're taking a walk up to length, you know, log of the size of the graph, you're very unlikely to find a collision. So as if N is basically less than log P, although I haven't told you yet about the size of the graph, we'll talk about that later. It's roughly P over 12. Um, so if N is roughly up to log P and you take a walk of length N, non-backtracking, you expect to hit about two to the n vertices. So what that means is that for optimal expander graphs, we expect the diameter to be roughly log of the size of the graph. So this is kind of an important point because what it means is that um, this, this log, log of p or log of the size of the graph is um, a kind of a cutoff point in the theory of um, Ramanujan graphs where if you take a walk that's, uh, that, that's roughly the diameter, and so you, you need walks of that length in order to hit everything, and that's just a counting argument that I just gave you. And then if you, um, wanna, if you wanna say like two random points in the graph, are they connected by paths that are much shorter than this? And the answer is no, like the number of paths that you have between uh, random pairs of vertices of a given length is um, gonna like right around the log P um, cutoff point, you'll start to get paths and then the number of paths will go up exponentially. But below that, you're very likely to have zero paths of a smaller length, especially like half the diameter. So that's gonna be important uh, later in this talk for um, something that I'd like to explain. So now um, for the next kind of uh, section of my talk, I'd like to go back to, to the application. So in the first talk, I talked about the application um, to cryptographic hash functions that we defined, which was basically just that um, once you have one of these nice expander graphs, in particular a Ramanujan graph where you don't have a good way to find paths, you can use that as a basis for a hash function because you can kind of take a random walk and output the endpoint. And then for somebody to find a collision, they need to be able to find another path from the starting point to that one or to be able to find a pre-image, they need to be able to find the path that you had from, from, the, from the starting point. So now I'd like to talk about another application, important application, which is key exchange. So if any of you know about Diffie-Hellman key exchange, it basically, it's a way for two parties to um, exchange information publicly and um, the, uh, 
agree on a common secret, but with only publicly exchanged information. So the way Diffie-Hellman works, either on an elliptic curve or in an abelian group, such as Z mod PZ star, is that um, you'll have uh, some generator for the abelian group, and each party will have a random multiple of that generator, like they have their own secret party. Alice will have you know, A times P and Bob will have B times P. And you can exchange these and the secret will be A, B times P because they each have their own secret and they each receive a point which they can multiply by their own secret. But everyone else will only see A times P and B times P, which when they add them together, they get A plus B times P. So the idea of the Zhao DeFeo Plute key exchange is a generalization of this Diffie-Hellman idea. And that is that instead of having a secret multiple of a point, what you have is a kind of a secret subgroup in each case. You have a secret isogeny. Alice has a secret isogeny. Bob has a secret isogeny. So these are phi A and phi B. Those are the secrets. So you should think of those as being analogous to like a random integer that was used in the Diffie-Hellman um, protocol. So now what's going to happen is how do we create a, a key exchange out of this? So first, let me tell you the setup. So what you're going to need is a super singular elliptic curve E. So in general, it's defined over at at most, uh, we're going to take a model defined over at most GFP squared. Um, we need P of a special form for this to work. So in general, P is going to be something like um, L. So there's two small primes, L sub A and L sub B. But for the purposes of this uh, exposition, you can just think of L sub A being equal to two and L sub B being equal to three. In practice, that's what you'd, you'd use. So the point is, is, is that you need isogeny graphs for two small primes. L A is two, L B is three. And then once you've fixed what are those small primes, you need um, primes, large primes P, which are like L A to the M times LB to the N plus one. And there's a key point here, a couple of key points. The, again, these integers uh, or these natural numbers M and N are just, they don't have anything to do with any Ms or Ns you see in other earlier parts of my talks. They're just random uh, integers, but they need to be around the same size. And um, if they are around the same size, then each of them is roughly half log P, as you can see, because two and three are the two base primes. They're very close to each other. You're just adding one to the thing. So, you know, log of if M is roughly equal to N, then log P is basically like 2M or 2N. So the, these um, need to be fairly large because you need a prime of cryptographic size. So uh, when I talk about the generic attacks, you'll, you'll see that you know, if you have only exponential attacks on the system, they're um, like square root attacks, then that allows you to take your system, your, your prime to be um, relatively smaller than if you had better attacks like sub-exponential attacks. And so in particular, at least for the hash function, we took P to be a prime of roughly 256 bits. And that was because um, we only had square root, new of square root attacks on our system, which means the best algorithms would run in roughly time two to the power 128. In this case, we need to take um, P to be kind of at least twice as large because we're dealing with two isogeny graphs that are now like half the, the bit length of uh, half of log P. So P needs to be bigger for this application, um, but still like in the range of uh, like 500 uh, bits. So that's not too bad. And um, so that's, that's the setup. Now we're gonna have a, um, some public uh, parameters that are made public for this key exchange. Much like for uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, you would have the elliptic curve would be public and the, um, the generating point P would be public. And then the two parties would make their, they would exchange their, their multiples of the points. So those would be made public. 
So our public parameters are going to be um, A is going to have a uh, write down generators of the L to the LA to the M torsion. B is gonna write down generators of the LB to the N torsion. Um, and so the reason for picking these um, uh, special primes, the picking the prime the way we do is so that, and that it's super singular. So you kind of know the order of the group over FP and FP squared is that the, these um, torsion points will now be defined over the base field, which is very important because if you have to go to a really large extension field in order to get your, um, your base points to be defined, that means all your arithmetic in your whole system will have to be done over this very large extension field of the finite field. And you wanna avoid that for efficiency reasons. Um, so, uh, for the actual key exchange, the, the secret parameters, like I said, uh, Alice is going to have a secret isogeny. And that really is just, like I said, for separable isogenies, they're completely determined by their kernel. So if it's going to be um, an L to the M, I'm, I might not always say L sub A to the M, but it's L A to the M torsion um, uh, point generates a, some subgroup of the um, LA to the M torsion on the elliptic curve. So that's just determined by picking two integers, M sub A and N sub A, taking these multiples of these generators, P sub A and Q sub A. And so then Alice has her secret uh, subgroup, which is generated by this L sub A to the M torsion point. And um, B is going to do the same thing, pick two random integers. Now he has uh, a subgroup, uh, which is, is secret. And But remember, so going back to this picture, um, these are two, these are walks on two different isogeny graphs. So you can see my cursor, right, when I point to the arrow. So the phi sub A is on the L sub A isogeny graph, phi sub b is on the l sub b. So it's easier for me to say, Alice is walking on the two torsion graph, Bob is walking on the three torsion graph to start with, okay? And now what's gonna happen, just spoiler alert, is that for the second step, Alice is gonna walk on the other graph and Bob is gonna walk on the other graph. So it's gonna, it's gonna flip. So now um, to complete the diamond, a computes the points um, uh, phi sub A uh, applied to Bob's public points P sub B and Q sub B and sends these to B. And then, Bob, I'm sorry, Alice computes that. And then Bob computes the image of Alice's public points under his secret isogeny and sends those to A. So one thing that you might notice here is, is that besides the, um, the, the elliptic curves that have been revealed here. So E was the public starting point and now E sub A and E sub B are revealed. There's also this extra information that has now been revealed, which is the images under the secret isogenies of the generators for the other um, torsion um, uh, module. Okay, so now what um, Alice and Bob can each do is they can use that information that they obtained in order to compute um, the secret isogeny um, or the, the elliptic curve E sub AB, which is um, the J invariant of the curve um, and the J invariant of that curve E sub AB will be the shared secret. So again, the fact that separable isogenies are determined by their kernels is very important here because the reason that this is a diamond that they end up in the same place is because um, in fact, after exchanging this information, applying their own secret to the other person's uh, kernel, they actually have both quotiented by the same kernel in the end, if you compose the two steps, the two arrows on top and the two arrows on the bottom. So that could be something to um, kind of check as an exercise if you want. So now let's talk about the security of this key exchange. So the funny thing is, is that when this was first proposed, 
um, in Zhao and DeFeo and Plu's paper in 2011. Um, they talked about the security as being related to um, about five different hard problems that they stated, so, and some of which they related to each other, and none of which they actually related to the pathfinding problem. So the result was that I think for a number of years, not many people read in detail what those problems were and how hard they were, but it was also just very confusing if you looked at it and read it. And so I think it was pretty well known um, to those of us working in the field that the hardness of breaking the key exchange re relied on the hardness of the pathfinding problem that we had introduced in the CGL hash function. But it didn't seem to be uh, written down anywhere. And so as part of our uh, Win4 project in uh, 2017, we wrote down a security reduction and uh, estimated the um, probability that um, if you can um, if you can find paths, then the um, the probability is overwhelmingly that you can break the break the key exchange. So the reason for that is because if you can find paths between E and E A. So let's go back to this this diagram. Finding a path is essentially finding the secret isogeny. So you might say, like, if you can find a path in the two isogeny graph between um, E and EA, or in the three isogeny graph between E and EB, um, you might say, well, what if you found a different path, not the one that they had used for their secret isogeny? So. Uh, that's why let's go back to the discussion that we had earlier about um, the number of paths of different lengths between uh, pairs of vertices in these Ramanujan graphs. So um, for any two um, uh, random vertices in the graph, it is extremely unlikely that there would be any path between them of length half the diameter. So the, that probability would be like P to the, to the minus one half. So if P is you know, like five, 512 bits, the probability of, of there being a path is like one over two to the power 256. So it's overwhelmingly unlikely that there's, that there's no path. So if you can find a path, you're overwhelmingly likely to have found the special path that you know exists because they created it when they were making doing the key exchange. So um, if you can find paths between these two uh, vertices, then you're um, most overwhelmingly likely to be able to break the key exchange. So um, this just kind of quantifies this in terms of the size of LA and LB and N and M, which like I said, if N and M are roughly equal in size, then it's going to be roughly P to the power of minus one half. Okay, so I have about, I was hoping that I would, uh, I have about 15 minutes, is that right? Um, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, I'm going to do a little bit out of what I had wanted to do for the second, uh, for the third lecture, because I kind of have too much um, content um, for the third lecture. So I'm going to kind of keep going into the slides for the third lecture and start to talk about the um, the attacks on this problem. So what do we know about attacking these systems today? So uh, when we introduced these super singular isogeny graphs, we stated these, this was actually the exact wording of, uh, of the hard problems that, that we stated at the time. I've just added the parentheses um, so that you so that you know what I'm talking about. It's basically collisions, cycles, and paths. Like, um, to find, uh, uh, if you read the whole statement, it's uh, problem number one is to produce a pair of super singular elliptic curves and two distinct isogenies of degree L to the N between them. Um, that's if 
the L and P are fixed here. Um, so that uh, would allow you to find um, collisions in the graph in the in the hash function. Problem number two is uh, related. It's uh, cycle finding in the graph. So it, given an elliptic curve, if you can find an endomorphism of degree L to the 2n, but which is not the multiplication by L to the n map, then that means it's basically the composition of having walked around uh, the graph like 2n steps and gotten back to the to the elliptic curve that you started at, which is finding a cycle. And then problem number three is, so given two super singular elliptic curves, find an isogeny of degree L to the N between them. So all of these are um, described, problems described in terms of the elliptic curves, which are labeled by their J invariants. And um, on that side of the picture, the best known algorithms that we have today for attacking this system are still the uh, what we call generic algorithms. So generic attacks in cryptography are uh, ones that run um, basically like as if the underlying object is kind of uh, like a black box. So there's nothing really special about the fact that the vertices are actually we're just treating it as a graph with vertices that have labels. And one approach we can take for a generic, what are called square root attacks, is just to simply walk around the graph at random. Like I'll go back to, let's specify problem number three, pathfinding. So if you have two super singular elliptic curves and you just start walking from each of them, so uh, take a random walk from one side, take a random walk from the other side, um, you get uh, the possibility that in roughly square root time, you will they will hit each other, so you'll get a collision. And that's often referred to as like a birthday attack or a birthday style attack. And the running time is uh, heuristically roughly the square root of the group size. So just to remind you that um, if the group size, if the group has order um, P, that takes you uh, log P bits to represent. So an algorithm that runs in time, like P, roughly P to the one half, that's an exponential algorithm. It's exponential in log P, which was the number of bits it took you to write down your system. So, uh, Class or generic attacks are exponential attacks, and in uh, in crypto, there's a kind of a a convention which is that uh, systems that are proposed are generally known to have generic square root attacks against them. So that that's why you're always going to take like if you want 128 bits of security for elliptic curve crypto and you have only exponential generic attacks, then you set the bit size for your prime to be double that, 256 bits. So everybody kind of knows that there's square root attacks on pretty much everything in sight. And so a lot of times um, we think of systems as being broken if you have better than square root attacks. And so for example, that's what is the case for genus three. We have exponential algorithms for genus three, um, Jacobians, uh, Diffie-Hellman based on uh, genus three Jacobians, which are better than square root. And so everybody talks about them as being broken. They're not exactly uh, broken in the sense that um, if you take into account like the constants that are hidden in the, um, in the big O notation and some of the uh, actual costs of doing the operations, they might not be, strictly speaking, running faster than a square root attack, but asymptotically they look worse. They, they look like they're better attacks than the square root attacks. Like, so um, in cryptography, if you have an attack which is better than square root, people often think of the system as being broken. Now, that's not exactly true, though, because if you think of RSA, RSA is widely deployed around the world, and we have sub-exponential attacks on, uh, you know, on factoring. So the, the number field sieve is a sub-exponential algorithm. 
And um, so we don't think of RSA as being really broken. That's why the sub-exponential is kind of a, um, a middle case in that earlier slide from my first lecture, because um, in, in the quantum world, I showed you the running time of the polynomial or the, the polynomial time quantum algorithms against RSA. And then we really say it'll be broken. But we live in a world today where our classical algorithms against RSA are, um, are sub-exponential. And, and that means all that we, we do then is to increase the bit size of the, of the modulus n that we use for, for the RSA attack. So it's not, it's not exactly true to say that it's broken if you have a better than square root attack, but that is kind of the, the gold standard. So um, now that I've given you some context on generic kind of square root attacks, um, uh, the next thing to consider is, do we have anything better than that in our case of the super singular isogeny graphs? So um, let me um, let me use take this opportunity to start in on the um, kind of quaternionic description of these graphs, which I mentioned was introduced uh, by Pizer. So given the um, the, I think that Yana has some exercises in the um, exercise sheet that you'll be working on either tomorrow morning or, or Friday morning that relate to the, the quaternion side. So it's uh, the quaternion side of things. So it's not bad that we're um, starting to talk about this now. Um, the quaternionic interpretation of the SIG graphs is um, as follows. So I told you uh, several definitions of uh, Super, the super singular property of elliptic curves. We say an elliptic curve is super singular mod P if its endomorphism ring is a maximal order in the definite quaternion algebra BP infinity. So um, I'll say a little bit more about what is BP infinity in a minute, um, but the, I also told you that a lot of times cryptographers that are working on these graphs in practice don't even really need to use the super singular property. But in fact, the super singular property is behind a, a lot of what we've been talking about. For example, the connection with um, the theory of modular forms and the Ramanujan property uh, all follow from the, um, the super singular assumption. Um, this, uh, the size of the graphs is actually, um, also kind of related to that. So the Eichler class number is, uh, gives you the size of the graph, which is the basically the number of um, level P Eichler orders, which is roughly P over 12. And finally, also the during correspondence, which associates with an elliptic curve, it's a maximal order in a quaternion algebra. So uh, now what that means is, is that if just think about if you had an explicit during correspondence, then that would mean that you could, um, instead of thinking of your graph as being given by elliptic curves, the vertices are super singular elliptic curves labeled by their J invariant, you could think of it as being given by all of the over on the quaternion side, the maximal orders, which are actually the endomorphism rings of the super singular elliptic curve. So this motivates why we want to um, talk about uh, quaternion algebras. So um, BP infinity is the notation that we use for the definite quaternion algebra, which is ramified um, at P and infinity, only at P and infinity. So um, there's a lot of theory and theorems about quaternion algebras, which I'm not gonna be able to cover here because I'm not going to give a whole course on quaternions. Um, but like one fun fact is that if I'm remembering this correctly, definite quaternion algebras have an even number of places at which they're ramified. So um, if you're not familiar with this terminology, 
going back to um, the way that I learned these things early on was from um, Vey's theory of central simple algebras. And so central simple algebras could be either like division algebras or matrix algebras. So um, we say that a prime is ramified if when you localize at that prime, you get a kind of non-trivial um, algebra in the sense that it's not a matrix algebra. So at most primes, you um, when you localize or you tensor with um, like uh, QL or ZL, you'll get the matrix algebra. So MT, M2ZL or M M2QL. But if you get um, a non-trivial division algebra, then you call that a ramified prime. So if um, that was, um, um, I'm sorry, I didn't put a, a reference in here for that um, background on, on this topic, but I, I can um, put some references in for next time if you want to look more at that. So BP infinity is a uh, rank, rank four Q algebra, and it's going to have a uh, one I, J, K that satisfy the following properties. So I squared is um, A, J squared is B, and K is I times J, which this is non-commutative, which is equal to minus J, I, where um, A and B, we have formulas for what A and B should be, depending on the congruence class of P. I'm just giving you one example of them here, and that is when P is congruent to three mod four, for example, um, then A, B should be minus P minus one. So that means we're taking like, sorry for the notation here, because here J is the square root of minus one, whereas I is the square root of minus P. <laughs> so I probably, I don't remember why I did the notation that way, but it's consistent throughout my slides. So I'm just keeping it. Um, but so what it means is, is that you have a, um, a quaternion algebra BP infinity that's generated basically by one and then the square root of minus one and the square root of minus P and that these two things do not commute. Um, and you can actually realize these as you can think of like square root of minus one, for example, as being a matrix like zero, one, one um, sorry, zero, one, one, zero with the ones on the off diagonal, and that'll be, um, uh, that'll give you a, a square root of minus one. So the, that's, I think it's a, it's a good way to think about these things as, as matrix algebras. And in fact, if you look at a, at a lot of the algorithms in this space, uh, they rely on thinking of these elements as, as matrices. So now um, I'm also giving you an example here of a maximal order, um, but I haven't really, I'm gonna start I think next time with all the definitions of uh, the quaternion orders and ideals. I haven't really gotten into all of those definitions, um, but the, uh, the, the maximal order, an example of a maximal order that I'm giving here, I think you have an exercise that relates um, to this special maximal order. Um, so I just wrote down the basis for it here. So I, I think I'm a little bit out of time at this point. Um, basically for my outline that I gave you at the beginning, I, uh, we covered the expander graphs and Ramanujan graphs and the Ramanujan property of the super singular isogeny graphs and then related that to the hardness of breaking the key exchange and why the breaking the key exchange relies on the hardness of, of the pathfinding problem. And so now just at the end, we started talking about quaternion algebras. And again, the motivation is because this can um, give us potentially a better way to attack this pathfinding problem of analytic curves by working on the quaternion algebra side. So in the next lecture, I will give more background on the quaternion algebra side and then give our algorithm for attacking the, what we call the quaternionic pathfinding problem and um, an application of that algorithm in the, um, to the uh, 
to the goal of constructing signature schemes also for cryptography. Okay, so thank you very much. I don't know whether, you, did you want to have questions or um, just stop at that point? Um, well, I think first we can, we can all, you can join me by thanking you for your, for your lecture. And if there are questions, yeah, you can, you can unmute yourself and ask them or, or you can type in the chat. Hey, can you see the chat, Kristen? I mean, I guess we've been, well, maybe you don't want to read the chat right now, because it's just been, <laughs> it's just been, a. I mean, most, I think most of the questions have been answered, but let's see if there are any specific ones here that maybe, I think most of the questions, did, did, let's see, does anybody who asked a question want to ask, ask it to Kristen or? Or, or, or ask a new question. Okay, I can see the chat now. I, I pulled it up. Yeah, but I'm just saying, maybe you don't want to read it now because it's most, I mean, well, yeah. I don't know. It's just a it's bunch long. of stuff. <laughs> I think most of the questions have already been answered. So, um, yeah, so I guess no, no, no more questions. Oh, you're sorry, Enrique, you have a question. Yeah, I can have one. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Christine, uh, so you mentioned this paper um, from 2007, the CGL, the second one. Which paper, I'm sorry? The one where uh, you generalized uh, Ramanujan graphs uh, to higher oh, dimensional yeah. varieties. Mm -hmm. But in that paper, the graphs so were restricted to varieties that had real, some real multiplication. And is there any reason for that? Or is, do you think it's possible it would be possible to give graphs that don't have that restriction of some real multiplication. I know this is maybe out of the, of the lecture, but. No, no, that's a very nice question. Um, so like um, for context, okay, so first of all, high level, I always encourage everyone to try to think of um, how to propose a, like crypto systems based on math objects that are new, that haven't been used before, or that are more general than what is being used. So that's kind of what you're asking here. So uh, I didn't talk about this paper of the higher dimensional case here, and I wasn't planning on going into the details next time either. But um, it's basically a generalization of super singular isogeny graphs, but on the quaternion side. And so instead of maximal orders, um, which are certain type of Eichler orders in the quaternion algebra that I just uh, defined for you, which is a definite quaternion algebra over Q, we instead looked at uh, definite quaternion algebras over totally real fields L. And those totally real fields um, L also had some extra conditions that we needed. For example, we put they needed to have um, narrow class number one and just be, be special for a bunch of really technical reasons. And in that case, what we could show is that the graph that you construct by instead of taking basically, you know, Eichler orders in BP infinity, if you take um, uh, these quaternion algebras over the totally real field, that you could look at what we called super special orders, and then you could prove that you also get a Ramanujan graph. Now, that doesn't mean that you couldn't do something else. So I interpreted your question as meaning like, could you take some other fields L, like even totally real, but removing the narrow class number one uh, restriction, you can kind of see what happens there, or maybe just take other number fields or other objects and create other graphs. And so, I don't, I didn't think about that. So I don't know what else could be done in that direction. That just happened to be um, the kind of the conditions that we needed in order to be able to use the theorems that existed to show that this was an, a, another construction of Ramanujan graphs. And in fact, uh, our point was to construct uh, embedded uh, like towers of Ramanujan graphs because you could um, take bigger and bigger L's that were embedded in each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. 
Yeah, I was asking um, just because uh, you can take the full graph of super special varieties, but then that is too large and has too much structures going on. So that's why my question. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, just to give you an example going in that direction. So more recently, um, people in cryptography have proposed using genus two um, curves for doing this kind of, you know, isogeny graph. And at the time we originally proposed um, the, the CGL, all the CGL work, we didn't even have good ways to compute isogenies for higher dimensions. So if you have a, had a dimension to a billion variety and you wanted to compute an isogeny, we didn't have any way to do that. But then um, the AVI package by Damien Robert and um, his collaborators um, was uh, released in, I don't know, probably sometime around 2008 or nine. And so now we can actually compute isogenies um, on higher dimensional from higher dimensional abelian varieties. Um, but still, it's there's a lot of um, practical aspects. Of, like, let's say you just want to make a hash function out of our um, construction of from super special um, super special orders, the generalization of you know the Eichler orders. It's horrible because we don't even have labels. We don't have labels. Um, you can take a basis for the for the order, but we don't have any way to tell whether one basis is the same, uh, defining the same order as another basis. And so as a label, one of the things we thought about is, is that you can construct a Hilbert modular form from taking the representation numbers for that basis. So you would um, take the, the, AN, the nth coefficient a n would be the number of elements in this super special order um, whose norm it was equal to n. And then you, could, you get this Hilbert modular form. And if you have enough coefficients of the Hilbert, the, the Hilbert modular form is basically um, encoding uh, the information that comes from the norm form from the from the order. And if you have enough coefficients of that form, you can say, oh, I got it. I, I'm, there's no other order that this could have come from. But like in the elliptic curve case, the number of coefficients that you need for the analogous thing is square root of P, which is exponential. That's horrible. And so that was th those are their best ideas for a label. That's a horrible idea for a label. And then, another, then the next problem was the thing I mentioned about not being able to compute the isogenies and et cetera, et cetera. So there were a lot of problems. So if instead you kind of cross over to genus two curves with a specific model for the curve, that's uh, more like what I've introduced here as the SIG graphs where you have models for your elliptic curves with J invariants and everything. And genus two curves have really nice, um, these Richelieu isogenies, which are two, two isogenies. And those are very explicit to compute, just kind of like Velu is very explicit. And so there's been this proposal, oh, well, why don't we just use genus two curves with Richelieu isogenies? But then it's a little bit like what you said with your idea, there's, we can't prove very many theorems about things, like whether they're even connected graphs, whether they have good, whether they're expander graphs, whether they're remote. We know they are connected now, by the way. Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, yeah. And the subgraph of Jacobians is, is connected as well, yeah. But uh, still yeah. no Ramanujan properly. So. Yeah. But if you see them as a sub a sub um, graph of the other, I don't know, maybe you can connect it. Okay, yeah, thank you. There. All right, are there other, other quick questions? Okay, well, thank you again. And